Well, good morning, everyone. It is so great to have you here with us. I know that there are lots of things that you're thinking you should be doing this morning, but we're so appreciative that you're taking time out from your busy day to join us for another great presentation. Uh, today, as you can see on the screen, we're going to be having a, an entire team of presenters with us from the BYOT chat group. And I know that you're going to be really excited to hear all of the tips and tools and strategies and suggestions they have for us. If you have no idea what BYOT is, or if you're already doing it and are looking to uh, improve that, or if you just want to find out how you might get started. So welcome to all of you, and welcome to our special guest, the BYOT chat team. As I'm sure you're all aware, we do have a live binder for our um, uh, show today. And it's not the link I just dropped in the room. It's this link. And I'll drop that in for you. <clears throat> the Live Finder is a place where we compile tons of links for you, both those that are being shared in the presentation and also lots of supplemental resources. And all of the resources today are related to the topic of BYOT and BYOD. So feel free to check that out after the show or even follow along with us. As you all know, all of our shows are recorded, and we post them in our archives. And on our archive page, you'll find recordings for all of our previous shows. And um, shortly after the show is over, we will be posting today's archive. And you'll be able to view the recording, access the chat log, and access the live binder and all of the links. You can also subscribe to iTunes U, and we'll talk about that at the end of the show. Now it's the, the fun time for all of us to grab that little pointer, that starburst over there, and place yourself on the map. Remember, you're going to double click on that, and then find where you're located on the map, and click to place yourself. And one thing you should know, if you put your dot down and it doesn't go right where you want it, you can click and drag it and move it to wherever you like it. So that way, uh, it gives you a second chance. Now, as you can see, these starbursts are pretty large. And they kind of fill a whole state. So if you would also type your location in the chat, that would be awesome so that we could see a little more of a pinpoint of where you are. It is so great to having you join us. And I see that we not only have a lot of folks from the US, but we also have UK joining us. and. Uh, Scotland, and we anticipate that possibly Shambles Guru will be with us from Bangkok, Thailand again today, because this is one of his favorite topics. So thank you for sharing that with us. And with that, I'm going to move on to the next interactive part of our show. We always like to ask a few poll questions of you to provide some information for our presenters. So we'd like to know, do you currently work in a BYOT or BYOD school district or even university? If you could go over there to the polling options and click yes for um, if you are and no if you're not. And if it doesn't apply to you, you can just leave it out, and that will show up just as a none on the chart there. Give you just a minute to do that. See, quite a few of you are not in a BYO district or school. So I think that you're going to be delighted with what you're going to be learning about today. And I'm going to just publish those responses here so that you can see them. And as you can see, there are about half of us that are not working in a, in a BYOT district, and just a handful, 23% or nine of us, who are. So thanks for voting there. Now we're going to give you another chance. 
have you used BYOT or D in your own classroom? So I'm going to clear that out and have you vote again. And if you said no on the first one, you may be saying no on this one because often the same policies drive what you do in your classroom as in your school. So go ahead and vote here, yes, if you have used it in your classroom, and no, if you haven't. This is awesome. We have a wonderful audience for our BYOT chat team today. And I'll just publish those results for you. And it's very similar to our earlier ones. 35% are not using it in your classrooms. 23% are. And 40% of you, either it doesn't apply to or you haven't figured out how to vote yet. And we hope that you'll begin to catch on to that soon. And our final question is, do you feel, based on what you know about bring your own technology or bring your own device, do you feel those benefits outweigh the concerns? Go ahead and vote yes if you think the benefits outweigh the concerns, and no if you don't think they do. Excellent. You're doing a great job with responding to the poll questions. That's wonderful. And I do know that you can vote on an iPad with the poll questions. You can't see the web tour, but you can vote. All right, so I'm going to publish those results. And you can see that we have a receptive audience here. We are eager to learn. And we really do believe that the benefits can outweigh the concerns. So that's terrific. Thank you so much for voting. And now we're going to officially kick off our show. And I'm going to say a huge welcome to our BYOT chat team. And I'm going to do a quick introduction for them, but I think that they're going to do a little bit of introduction of themselves, too. do want to let you know that our great friend and co-moderator, Lorna, is not with us today. She's doing some family things today. But we do have multiple moderators in the room today. And it's so great to always have Tammy Moore here doing closed captioning for us. And that's such a wonderful service. If your English is not your primary language, it helps to open up that closed captioning and see what Tammy is typing in there so that you get what the speakers are saying along with whatever may be on the slide. Also, so appreciate having Lori Moffitt with us, who is faithfully here every week, grabbing questions from the chat and jumping on the mic at the end to share them with all of you. And of course, Kim Case, our faithful co-moderator, is also helping with everything today. So Kim is going to try to keep up with the chat, as I will as we go along. And if you do have questions, feel free to post them in the chat. And we'll be sure to ask them after they get through some of their presentation. So I want to welcome these four team members on the BYO chat team. That would be Steve Hayes, Tim Clark, Jeremy Angoff, and Nathan Stevens. We are so appreciative to have you with us. Jeremy and all of their links are in our live binder, so you'll be able to learn more about them and see the fabulous resources they have been compiling on BYOT, as well as all kinds of technology. Jerry, Jeremy is the manager and co-founder of Ounceit, which is a small startup consulting for, firm that specializes in technology for academia. He's also the interim director of technology at Cambridge School of Weston in Massachusetts. And Tim Clark is the coordinator for instructional technology for Forsyth County Schools in Georgia. And he's been a classroom teacher and a school-based ITS for over 20 years. Steve Hayes is a regular participant in our shows, and we are so thrilled that he brought this group to our attention so that we could share them with all of you. Steve is actually the director of bands for the Roanoke Benson School District in Roanoke, Illinois, an ardent supporter of educational technology, and is a jazz saxophonist. 
such a talented uh, techie person. It's great to have him with us. And Nathan Stevens is an educational engineer with uses iPad, blogs a lot about teaching with your iPad, and is assistant director of College Ed Media Center in North Carolina, Raleigh, North Carolina at the North Carolina State University. One of my favorite places because I have family in North Carolina. So welcome to all of you. I am going to advance us to our newbie question, ask it, and turn the mic over to Steve to begin the presentation. So our newbie question is, what is the impact of bring your own technology or bring your own device in education? And I know they're going to be sharing that throughout their presentation. So Steve, take it away. Well, thank you so much for having us today, Peggy. Um, those of you that are um, joining the chat today, I have to tell you this, that Peggy has been the nicest person to work with. Um, at the, having a group do the um, presentation is not the easiest thing in the world, and Peggy has just been a very sweet individual and in bending every over backwards to um, accommodate us. Um, first of all, the four of us would thought thought that we would just um, introduce ourselves, but Peggy's already done that. So I think we'll just um, move on to the next slide. And this is um, a little bit about BYOT chat. Um, I have a blog called A Teacher's Coda. And I, I call it A Teacher's Coda because, um, well, obviously I'm a music teacher, and coda means the end. And I've taught for um, a little over 30 years. And so I'm towards the end of my career, and I'm looking at retirement. and in a number of years, close years, but so that's why I came up with the teacher's coda. And I really only blog just for my own benefit. I don't try to, you know, attract followers or, or be any kind of um, big um, presence on the web in, in education technology. I just wanted to do it to learn myself. And um, originally our school district was going to do one-on-one -on -one iPads, and I was, I'm the local computer geek among our staff, and so they put me on the iPad committee, and we had a pilot program. Um, but a lot of issues came up for our schools, and, and since we're in the building phase, we um, the more we looked at into um, BYOT, the more we thought that it was a better fit for our school district. So um, on my blog, which not too many people actually see, I put out a um, a help wanted post, and I t tweeted it out on Twitter. And I said, please retweet it. And um, it got retweeted by a lot of people. And, and these um, gentlemen came to my assistance. And so in um, February of 2012, we started BYOT Chat. Now, if you're unfamiliar with um, BYOT Chat, it's a Twitter chat. And we use the hashtag BYOT Chat. And every Thursday night between 9 and 10 PM, we, we meet and we talk. Um, we, um, through Twitter, and we discuss various aspects of BYOT. We usually put out what our topic is that night, and it varies a great deal. We um, sometimes do just basic tools and skills, um, and lots of times we, we do philosophies, um, how um, BYOT changes the, the way a teacher has to um, um, present material, project-based learning perhaps, or instead of being the sage on the stage, um, empowering students to accept the responsibility of their learning. It's a big change from going like from a 19th century teacher to teaching the way that we were taught to teach, or perhaps the way that we were a student back when I was a uh, grade school student in the 60s. It's a completely different scenario now. So we discuss all aspects of it, and people exchange ideas, and it's a, it's a great time. If you're not on Twitter, I would strongly suggest that you get on Twitter. Um, as a teacher, it's been the, the, an eye-opener for me. Um, it's um, the, the greatest professional development I have. Um, on the link right there, the Cyberman um, chat, which I, Peggy, can you drop into the chat window there, the, um, the list of all the Twitter chats. And you'll be amazed there's a Twitter chat for every grade level, every content level that meets at certain times. And there's um, always a way that you can connect with other teachers. Also, we have our BYOT chat archives, which are from our BYOT chat website. And um, if you look into that, you may want to say, well, you know, I'm interested about BYOT, but I, 
you know, what about um, filtering? What about um, applications to use? What about um, um, different types of um, teaching philosophies? You can search through our archives and see what the chats that we've had in the past. Um, and those are, it's a great deal of um, resources available there. Um, I have to tell you that my first impression of BYOT was, are you crazy? Um, I know um, the teachers I work with, and I love and respect a great deal, but I thought, you know, some of these teachers um, struggle with the technology that we give them, um, with the MacBooks that our school supplies to teachers, or the Apple TVs, projectors, and this was um, my first impression is, how are they going to be able to handle the technology that every student comes in with? Um, but the more I learned about um, BYOT, the more I learned that um, that's not the case. Um, the um, teachers do not have to be the tech expert of every device that the student brings in. The student um, already knows how to use those devices. That's not to say a teacher wouldn't help out a um, uh, student, you know, logging into the Wi-Fi network or, you know, a teacher's not going to turn their back on a student. But the teacher um, does not have to be the tech expert. Um, and also, BYOT does not really widen the digital divide. Um, schools are easier, it's easier for schools to um, manage the um, students that do not have devices. And also, a lot of times in BYOT schools, you'll find that students um, share devices um, and looking things up and doing things. Um, teachers do not need to fear that, um, that the tech tools are going to be a constant distraction, that the kids are only going to be um, uh, texting back and forth or um, on inappropriate websites you know, through their own 3G, 4G network. It's, the teacher does have a responsibility, though, to be an engaging teacher. So it does um, up the ball game sometimes as a teacher, but there's so many, many ways that a, a teacher can um, control the devices, you know, put them on the, on the desk face down. You know, now it's time to, um, to, to use our devices, our, our, our tools. Another um, initial fear that we had when I thought BYT was, oh, what a crazy idea was that, you know, people were asking, well, what about if a student brings their laptop to school and it's stolen? You know, well, basically, um, our, at my school, our response is that we provide you a locker, you know, and we're no, uh, we're not responsible right now for um, if you buy a $100 calculator for a, a math class, if you left it in the hallway and it's, it was stolen, you know, we're not going to be responsible responsible for your laptop either. And people looked at that and said, well, that makes sense to, to us. Um, there, there's a quote on the bottom there um, from 1905, the National Teachers Association, that students today depend too much on ink. They don't know how to use a pen to sharpen a pencil. Um, pen and ink will never replace the pencil. And I just posted that there because, you know, change is slow. Uh, we're in an organization, a career that does not accept change um, readily, and it's hard for some teachers to change. But we, we stress to our teachers that, you know, bringing in BYOT, and we like to think that the T stands for tool, not technology. It, we bring more um, technology into the classroom, and, that, um, and every teacher should be um, welcoming that. Uh, and the tech tools would, would vary. Kids would ask at first when we introduced this to our school district, well, what should I have? What should I bring? And it, would, it varies on the task. You know, sometimes a smartphone or an iPod Touch is the, is the perfect tool. And then sometimes, you know, a laptop would be the perfect tool um, to use. And we told students that they need to think about the tool they bring needs to have a you need to be able to consume content, to create content, and to collaborate. And then we told the teachers, the old way of thinking would be like, present a PowerPoint, but now that they need to be thinking, uh, create a presentation. That presentation could be, you know, an online slide rocket um, slide presentation. It could be a, um, a movie they create, an iMovie. Um, any number of tools, Web 2.0 tools, could be um, uh, used. I think Tim's going to take over now. Actually, it might be uh, me, Jeremy, who's taking over now. I'm not 
Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, Ken, do you have anything you want to say, or you want me to go ahead? Well, I, I, um, I just uh, Steve, I think did a, a great job doing that part of the explanation, um, and we are really seeing some transformational uses of BYOT. Um, and Jeremy, why don't you go ahead? Sure. So um, this is Jeremy from Ounce IT. Um, I'd actually just like to correct Peggy really quickly. I, I was the interim director of technology at the Cambridge School of Weston, but we found a full-time director now, and we love him. He's doing a great job, and he's really pushing at the Cambridge School of Weston for a BYOT program, and we're we're piloting iPads right now, among other devices. Um, what I love about BYOT is how when the students are given the option to choose their own tools, um, more of the, um, the control over the learning is put in the hands of the students. Um, one of my favorite um, things to do with BYOT and mobile learning in general is to take the learning out of the classroom. I find that the walls of the classroom um, contain the learning in the classroom. And if you take the kids out of the classroom, um, take them into the city or into the country or eventually or p potentially even around the world, it opens them up to so many more um, possibilities for learning. Um, interacting with real people. It's really authentic and it's really impactful. And um, mobile devices in general allow for this. But when you allow students to bring their own tools, um, and tools I think Steve mentioned this before. Tools, we like the, the term BYOT because of the, the word tool instead of device. Some students still in a BYOT environment may choose to use a pencil or a pen um, or just face-to-face -face conversation. And that um, flexibility is really important to us. Um, so with mobile learning, you get the kids out of the classroom and you can work with real life um, things, um, real life interactions with real people. And it's not just doing the rote um, memorization. Um, it's not just doing work, it's not just working with worksheets. Um, I guess I should be forwarding the slides too. Um, oh no, I shouldn't. I'll stick on this slide. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's authentic. Um, and that's something that, um, that I really appreciate. Um, Thanks to the internet, knowledge is now free. And while I do think that um, it's important for us to learn certain facts, that there should be a repertoire of knowledge that we have in our heads that is very, very important. But a lot of knowledge is available at a moment's notice via the web, via the internet. Um, it, it can be through search tools like Google, um, amazing resources like Wikipedia, and say what you want about it. It still gives us access to more information than people have ever had access to before. Um, it also helps us teach critical thinking skills to figure out what information is valid and is appropriate. Um, and that's true with all the resources on the internet. Twitter is an amazing resource. Even, and I know this makes a lot of teachers very nervous, but even Facebook is an amazing resource um, for sharing information with people around the world. And uh, teachers might be hesitant to jump right into Facebook, um, but there are some teachers, uh, Michelle Ludela um, is somebody I work with a lot. Um, she does amazing things with her students. She's a librarian um, in, uh, in New Canaan Public Schools in uh, Connecticut, and she does amazing things with social media in the classroom. At, in, New, in her school in New Canaan, one of the first things students are told to do is clean up their Facebook accounts so that their teachers can friend them and so that they can friend their teachers. Um, and obviously that takes a lot of trust. I don't think that um, I'm going to show this video now, although let me know if you want me to show a clip from it, but I'll give you the link. Um, she has this amazing video that she calls, that we call her uh, We Trust You video, and I'm putting that link in the chat on the side right now. Um, oh wow, it's hard to do that while I am talking, but Michelle Lutola. We trust you video. So I put that in the links on the side right now. Um, when you have a chance, it's a few minutes long, but watch this video. Um, what's important to realize with BYOT, and that's actually the case in the classroom and in schools and in an academic setting or even in a work environment in general, trust is the foundation. 
And her We Trust You video, I think, is a good uh, introduction to that. Um, the fact is you have to trust your students. And if you're nervous about using BYOT in your classroom or in your school, maybe you don't trust your students. And maybe that's actually something that you need to work on before you're ready to, um, to experiment with BYOT. Um, I'm going to turn over the presentation now to, uh, to Nathan, I think, or to Tim, or to anybody else on our team that wants to chip in. Hey, Nathan. I think, um, uh, I think I, 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 I can take over from here if we need. Great. So, so I am a big uh, proponent for creativity because, as a person in a, the university college environment, I I see students who have just had the created creativity pulled out of them, and so um, anything that any tool that they can use that really boost that create, creative uh, part of them to really think outside the box, you know, really, and then that leads into the critical thinking. And being able to use a tool on any device is just is something that uh, allows students to just take off. Um, personally, I'm from the, the Palm generation, and I, I I mean, I, there's so much that people could do on those devices that they never really thought about. Um, and most of the time, they were email web-based machines. And now, with there's so many uh, applications out there that allow you to collaborate and then create a end item, and also allow communication in the background. And so, st students could be using back channeling or or, or any sort of, I mean, there's just so many tools that allow students to just create an end product. And that's just one of, that's one of the things that um, I think we really push in our chat is, you know, have students create something and let them be able to show it off. All right. So, I mean, I guess let me ask uh, either Jeremy or Tim, where. I mean, if they want to chime in with the collaboration part. Um, so we. So one of the. Uh, I'm. I'm. A, go ahead, Nathan. I was going to say, like, we we do several pieces of collaboration where we have we do a virtual or a, we use whiteboarding tools. Um, one I really like is a group board. Um, if you haven't checked out Groupboard and you do iPad projects or laptop projects, you, it is so inexpensive to use. And you can have as many students on as on one board at one time, and or they can have individuals ones. And I, and that's just an example of just some of the tools that are out there. Um, so we use that. We have probably 37 to 40 students on one whiteboard at one time and they're mind mapping and doing that type of thing. And I'll let, uh, I guess that was Jeremy pick it if he wants to chime in. Uh, Nathan, you actually cut out there for a second, but um, uh, you, want me, you want me to chime in about collaboration in general? Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, because we all have good ideas about collaboration, so. Sure, I'm happy to. Um, so I, I actually, uh, Alms IT works with a bunch of different schools and also nonprofit organizations. So we're not, I, I have a background in, in education and as a teacher, um, but I started this company with a business partner a while ago when we realized that lots of schools are struggling with technology, not just on the IT side, but also on the academic side. And while my business partner focuses more on IT, I focus more on the classroom. And Something I started doing not too long ago is working with schools and, and organizations to help get their students out of the classroom. Um, some of the things that we've done are, um, I'm based in Boston, Massachusetts, and one organization that I worked with this summer called Boston Explorers took kids, um, urban kids, out into the city so they could see the city that they didn't even know that they lived in. Um, I mean, there's a wealth of history in Boston. There are amazing resources in Boston. There are amazing, there's amazing um, culture in Boston. And a lot of these urban kids 
had never really been exposed to that. Um, and we took them out with iPads, and this was a, a, the iPad part of this was a pilot this summer, and I think we're going to be doing it again next year. But we took them into the city and asked them as they found things that they found uh, that were interesting to them, we asked them to take photos, write little blurbs, take video, and they started taking lots of photos and videos and writing some things. I think next year we're going to try and compile it into something a little bit more, um, I don't want to say structured, but um, we're going we're gonna to try and produce some products next year. This year we just were trying to explore with iPads. But the BYOT component was that any students uh, that had their own devices, they were welcome to use their own devices. And the benefit of that is um, when you have a personal learning device like an iPad, an iPhone, an iPod Touch, an Android device, whatever, what have you, um, when the students bring their own devices, like I said, these are urban kids. A lot of them um, don't have uh, the money to have a, a, a laptop or a desktop or, um, or the technology that, I don't know, somebody um, like I take for granted. Um, what we were able to do is teach them how to use the devices they do have at their disposal. And if they don't have a device at all, we were able to teach them to share with their friends who did. And that was a piece where collaboration became really important. Um, the sharing of their devices, one kid who didn't have a device with another kid, sorry, one kid who did have a device with another kid who didn't, um, it taught them how to um, not just rely on what they have or don't have, but also um, help them access tools that they, that they um, and not just access, but also learn how to use tools that they don't even have and access all of these learning opportunities, both on the Internet and also the things right in front of them. So they were taking photos of historical Boston. They were taking videos. They were writing things. Um, and it was a really, really neat experience. And now that, um, now we've moved on to another organization called Apprentice Learning, um, which um, is going to take kids during the year where they, they're taking these kids out of their schools in Boston and sending them on apprenticeships with local small businesses in the Boston area, mostly in, in the Jamaica Plain section of Boston. And they're going to be taking video photos and writing about their experiences as they apprentice with these organizations. Um, and the authentic learning for them happens both by taking, these are eighth graders, the um, Boston Explorers are fifth graders. Um, authentic learning is happening on site in these businesses where they are apprenticing, but they're also collecting information, co collecting knowledge videoing, critical thinking about their experiences. And I'll hand off the microphone to somebody else on my team or ask if anybody has any specific questions. Um, like Peggy said, you can raise your hand in Blackboard. Um, I, one of the things I wanted to say about that is that we, we you know, one of, the, one of the things about BYOT, a lot of people get caught up in the technology and in the tools and in the, the devices and, and the Wi-Fi and you know, but really it's about an instructional strategy for kids. And so one of the ways that we've done that is to focus on those four C's of digital age learning. And um, so we've had specific chats about that, about the communication, critical thinking, collaboration, and creativity. So um, and, and what I tell teachers in my district is focus on teaching those four skills. So regardless of whether or not you're using technology, focus on these digital age skills. Uh, students might say they like using paper and pencil better, but we know that in the future they have to use technology. That's something that almost every job is going to require of them, so they have to develop these skills. So when teachers are trying to make that transition into becoming a BYOT classroom, uh, when they focus on these skills, then they're able to to more likely find a need for the technology, the tools that the kids are bringing to school just allow them to do things more that are more collaborative. Um, and also about the equity issue, we're finding that more collaboration does happen in the classroom because not every kid is bringing a device right now. So they still have school technology, but it just opens up more sharing. Uh, the first thing they want to do is turn to their neighbor and show them whatever they're working on with their device. So the classrooms really are, become collaborative learning environments, and then of course critical thinking too. So uh, you know, one tool for collaboration was Wikispaces or group board like Nathan said, but critical thinking uh, using something like Socrative or polling, back channeling, uh, something where every kid in the class is required to think and to respond, even using the DSI like in this picture where the students are using PictoChat to 
respond to each other and to share information uh, can be used for, for that without even having connection to the Wi-Fi and just uh, directly to each other. So uh, there are lots of ways to, to bring in that digital age skill. Uh, another one is creativity and, and maybe um, Steve or, or Nathan would like to talk a little bit about how they implement creativity in, in their schools. Well, implementing creativity is kind of a hard topic, um, broad topic to do, but we um, open things up to, um, you know, no longer are you uh, forced to do, like I said earlier, the traditional PowerPoint, you know, or I hate to even say this, you know, years ago we would have teachers that create a PowerPoint and then they have the students print out the PowerPoint and turn it in. It's like, if you think about that, how insane that is of creating a digital um, uh, content and then um, having it printed out and turned in. But you know those things happened you know years ago. But now students are um, with their own um, devices they're bringing in are able to um, create many things that we never really thought of before. You know video, audio capabilities, going out and outside your classroom and um, just developing things that we've never really thought possible. Nathan, were you going to say anything? Yeah, I was going to say that with the type of devices that are out right now and the type of tools that are out, creativity is unlimited. And that's the one thing I think we, we really show and I think that these devices really show that, you know, anything, any project we get that they're given that they, it, it's the limit of their imagination right now. Um, I mean, the, the tools, the web-based tools that anybody can access. It will, I mean, just enlighten, uh, just, uh, I mean, just lets the student just take off in that, that aspect. Uh, let's see, like, I'm trying to think of a, and it, a couple of ex examples. Um, like we've done some things with sock puppet apps with uh, young kids. We um, one application we used uh, recently was uh, the Auto Wrap app for the iPad, and the students didn't have to know anything about beats or anything. Basically, it converted their te whatever they said into music, and so we started working. We just wanted them to read books and. Instead of doing a book or written book report or even like a book trailer, we had them create raps about their books. And so, you know, it was just something that was really different. And it didn't take a student with any sort of musical talent to go take that to take that next step to try to create something that was really yeah, interesting. Yeah, let's get away with from the music teacher. <laughs> Uh, um, let's move on to communication. Um, I think this is gr a great deal of um, how students um, learn they can, from communicating with each other and teacher to student um, communication. Um, we're using things like Sully at our school where um, mass texting. I teach an online um, music theory class where assignments are given out through Sully um, and then the students um, have a conversation about the, um, the theory assignment through Sully. And then we also use Sully on a school-wide basis for um, um, emergency announcements and things like that. But there's other things besides Sully also um, that are available for um, mass texting. Tim, were you going to talk about project-based learning now? No, it's Sully. C e l dot l y is the um, website. And it's um, you text two three five five nine, which is the Sully. Um, uh, phone number, C-E-L-L-Y, and then you um, text out your message. And you can set it up to be like only one-way um, communication or two-way communication. Um, just to change the subject right now, I know um, all our thoughts and prayers are with the um, Newtown, Connecticut School District. Um, and then earlier with um, Hurricane Sandy, I know SatChat talked about the importance of social media and communicating with people and how it's important that schools actually use it before an emergency occurs. So um, I think communicating through social media is an important part of BYOT and that schools should not shy away from, from doing that. Kim? 
Thanks, Steve. And and if you like a little bit of this chaos of keeping up with a chat, a slide, talking at the same time, or following Twitter at the same time, you will really love BYOT chat every Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time because, as you know, this is what our kids go through every day. They they want um, multiple ways of learning and showing what they know and. Um, that's why BYOT lends itself very easily and, and well to project-based learning. And so again, focusing on kids developing projects instead of bubbling in uh, answers on standardized test scores, instead of that being the focus of a classroom, really focusing on the kids becoming producers with their own technology devices they, um, is, is a huge part of BYOT. And, and kids, um, know how to use their technology, but they don't know how to learn with their technology just natively. They need to have some guidance and some uh, teachers facilitating that for with them in the classroom. And one of the great ways is to learn alongside the students and to ask the kids what they can what they think they can do. You know, before BYOT we saw projects like this where you would go down the hall of a classroom and every kid is doing the same kind of project and very little differences and, and even the rubric the rubrics are just lacking rigor and not digging for higher level thinking. So we want to move beyond that um, and into some bigger impacts. I think Jeremy was going to talk about some, some of those big impacts. Uh, thanks, Tim. I also want to follow up with what Tim just said about how students don't always know how to use these tools as or devices as personal learning devices. The idea of using an iPhone or an iPad or um, an Android device or, um, or even a cell phone as a learning tool does not come naturally to the students always. Sometimes it does, but often it doesn't come naturally to the students. Um, even the students who are facile with the device don't necessarily know how to use it as a learning tool. And that's really important for students to be able to um, do. But it's also true that teachers don't always know how to use these devices um, as, as learning devices. And that's something that teachers and administrators and parents sometimes get hung up on. Um, we, uh, we repeat this over and over. There's a mantra of ours at, in, on the BYOT chat, um, not just from the moderators but the participants as well, that professional development, and actually we're kind of shying away from the term professional development, but learning opportunities for teachers are as important as the learning in the classroom for the students. We need to allow teachers the time to learn how to use these devices and these tools um, as, learning, as learning tools. Um, something that I'm a big fan of, um, Tim talked a little bit about the idea of um, project-based learning, um, but uh, Ewan McIntosh um, is, I'm a big fan of his, and he is somebody who introduced me to the idea of problem finding or problem seeking. And if you search for TED Talk for his, uh, for his video, um, you might be interested in seeing that. But the idea of problem seeking is based on the concept that there's a lot that we can learn based uh, from, from um, looking for problems and for you know, inquiry-based learning, asking questions, and just discovery, looking for things that, we, that we're curious about, learning about them, when the teacher doesn't necessarily have the answer that the student is looking for. That's when discovery happens and the teacher and the student can work together instead of the traditional role of, and I think I have a slide somewhere, uh, um, instead of this traditional role of the teacher at the front of the classroom and, um, here we go, instead of the traditional role of the teacher at the front of the classroom owning the knowledge and being in control of the knowledge and the information and, and presenting it at the students, with, um, with inquiry-based learning and problem-seeking and problem-finding, um, students are enabled and empowered to use their own curiosity to look for questions and then look for the answers to those questions. And I find that to be a very powerful um, uh, um, skill and a very powerful, powerful experience for both teachers and students. Um, anybody else on the team want to chime in? 
I, I think that uh, what you're saying there, Jeremy, is true. That um, first of all, I'm writing a question to you about what app did you use to create this slide? I really like it. Okay. <laughs> and I love this app. Um, this is an app called Paper, and the app itself is free on the iPad. Um, and I think they oh, my line. I think they're making one for Android or have one for Android, but maybe I'm making that up. Maybe I want that to be true. But anyway, it's an incredible app for the iPad. Um, I am not a good drawer. I, I've always wanted to be a good drawer, and I'm not. And the paper app makes you a better drawer. Um, I don't really know how. It's magic. That's what it is. It's magic. But this app is free, and then you can pay a few dollars um, to buy additional tools, like the um, the watercolor and things like that. And I don't want to spend too much time on one app, but this is one of my favorites. I'll thank well, you and you know the good point about this, and it's really just true, is that you know you learn about things in the View by IoT classroom just in time. Like you learn uh, just in time how to how to differentiate the instruction because somebody is doing something cool, and you're saying, "Hey, how does that work?" And then that's when you get your professional learning. So one of the important things about all of this is that the teacher has to be willing to learn alongside the students to figure things out, um, and you can't know it all ahead of time. Um, but but we're seeing that the that the conversation is switching that uh, instead of being very teacher directed, kids want what's happening to them uh, in the classroom to be about them and to use the tools they know how to use. Um, and I have something else. Oh, sorry. No, I was going to say that we also talk a lot about you know giving students the the risk of failure. I think that that keeps coming up, and I think that's also something we ought to. We ought to touch on as well that you know letting letting students have that opportunity to either succeed or fail and try another tool, and that's right. that's, that's definitely that's something an important that, piece of discovery learning. Yeah, and that's something I think that everybody ought to be able to that everybody that's in this uh, presentation or chat needs to just know that hey, not everything's going to work every time, and that's just and that's an acceptable. Piece to this. I like to I share the fact that I've got an eight-month-old son, and I actually nine-month-old now, and I love watching him learn because he learns in the most natural way possible. And while I watch him learn, I've been trying to take that back to the classroom and apply that in the classroom and out of the classroom with with my students and with my teachers. Um, when learning to watch him walk is really cool because he tries to stand up, he pulls himself up onto something. And then he falls over. And if he falls over, I give him a chance. He usually doesn't cry. And if I give him a chance, he picks himself back up and tries again. And eventually I know he's going to walk. Same thing with talking and same thing with anything else that he's trying to learn how to do. But if I were to go up to him right now and give him a traditional classroom style, teacher directed um, lesson on how to speak English, it's just not going to work. He's not going to learn that way. He's learning by trying and by doing and experimenting and failing and trying again. And also, um, I used to give my practice workshops to my five-year-old and see what would go on there, because this is the same type of idea. And then I'd go and give it to the professors, because I told them they learned the exact same way as a five-year-old. Now, they didn't quite like the same uh, joke, but it, it works across the board. Actually, that's something, the paper app that we mentioned before, um, that was something that I started doing um, when I saw um, other people using it. Actually, one person in particular, Brad Ovenel Carter, he's Brad O on Twitter. And he's actually guest moderated some of our, um, a couple of our Twitter chats. I saw him using Twitter to take notes at conferences and also to present at conferences. And I decided I wanted to be able to draw like that. And so I picked up the app. I think I already had the app, but I started using it in a different way when I saw him using it that way. And I knew that I wasn't a very, I felt that I wasn't a very good drawer. But I took the chance and I, and I ended up using that app to, to create all the slides for a conference um, that I presented outside of, um, outside of Chicago. And actually, I'm happy to share all of those slides with you um, if you want to see those other slides. But um, the fact is, students can do that in the classroom as well. They can, instead of taking Googling for photos and Googling for images on the internet when they want to create some sort of presentation or project, they can actually create their own slides. 
both um, actually the slide that you're looking right now, looking at right now, um, any of these slides, New Expectations or the next one, those are photographs that I presume Tim or somebody on his team took and used their own photographs in, in, in this presentation. Um, you, students can also draw their own slides or they can create their own music or create their own videos or it doesn't have to be finding things on the web. It can be finding things in real life or creating things themselves. I just posted the um, BYOT chat archives for our tool smackdown we had on November 8th and there was tons and tons of um, great um, suggestions made by um, the people that participated in that chat there. So it's a great um, resource for you to check out and, and look at. Are you, do we need to move to the question and answer session now? Uh, it's certainly time to do that, but I know you have some more slides to go through. Do you want to quickly go through those and then move to Q&A? I, I think that we, we can do that very quickly. I, I think that for us it's just all about, as you can see, we've made a community. Um, I think Steve and uh, Jeremy have, have bumped into each other before at a conference, but most of us haven't met each other face to face, yet we're still able to work together and collaborate online. Of course, we see that uh, the, the apps and the devices just make school more engaging for kids, but again, it's those digital age skills. Uh, the critical thinking that comes out of blogging, um, authorship uh, by posting content online and learning how to do that, but also personalizing instructions. So we've had students who make their own videos and, and and kids have been doing that for, for a long time, loading, th uploading things to YouTube, but now we can actually have the conversation about how they maintain privacy, how they um, are good critical thinkers, thinking about a digital footprint following them throughout their lives. And we couldn't do that before BYOT. It was something that you're just supposed to figure it out on your own at, at home, and yet we know that most kids go home and they're unsupervised on the Internet. Um, but so now with their own devices coming into school, we're able to help nurture a lot more discussions about what it means to be a digital age learner. And of course, it has some big impacts on the teacher. So again, like we've mentioned today, teachers need to learn alongside their students and, and practice, become users themselves, get a Twitter account, develop a professional uh, personal learning network also become good coaches. So BYOT is not just for one room of the school, it's, it's for everywhere. It's, it should be part of life. Um, but teachers need to be able to coach. Just if you think about a coach helping kids practice, develop re resiliency, persistence, uh, that has to happen with BYOT and finding ways to share with each other is great too. So instead of just having very close, everybody uh, does the same activity the same way, open it up, give the kids the standard or, or whatever, the topic, and let them brainstorm ways they can use their devices to show what mm -hmm. they know. And you don't have to have all the answers all the time. Because right. the students will come up with, the, with some answers that you won't even think about. And, and we fact, realize, yeah, go ahead. I just want to say briefly, in fact, um, when the teacher doesn't have the answers and when the teacher isn't the expert, sometimes that's when the best learning happens. Yeah. Actually, on this, on this Twitter chat this last, last Thursday, I recommended to a few people um, the idea of having the math teacher and the English teacher switch classes um, for one day or one week or as often as you like um, and give the students a chance to try and figure things out without an expert in the room. And you'll see learning happen in a very different way. And I just had the one last slide there about we're finding new uses for old tools like this one, uh, using uh, our textbooks to protect our heads during a tornado drill. But, but we can also find new uses for the tools kids already have in their pockets. And really everybody is BYOT, even if they don't admit it as a school, as we see from some of the rebels out there. But, um, but everybody's BYOT. Kids have devices in their pockets and we just want to help them learn new ways to use them and we want to learn new ways to use them too. Jim School, Forsyth County, Georgia is um, uh, I think the country's um, leading school in BYOT. 
Um, and you should ch really check out um, Tim School's um, BYOT resource page. Um, can that be dropped in to the, um, the chat window in the live binder? Uh, just to tell you a little bit about uh, Tim, he's too humble to, um, to um, bring this up, I bet, but we were um, having dinner with my family, watching the evening news for the summer, and all of a sudden here's um, um, Tim Clark with um, <laughs> Brian Williams on the NBC News um, chatting about BYOT and, um, and how his school is leading the way in, um, in mobile technology and mobile learning and bringing um, um, BYOT into the school room. Yeah, we've been into it now for our, our fourth year, actually our fifth. We spent one year just getting infrastructure ready, and now we have BYOT in all 36 of our schools. And of course, it's not that BYOT is perfect everywhere. We're still working on it. And one of my jobs is to go around and, and help build it. We've started having tours in our district for people to see BYOT, and even our teachers are saying that's how they learn more about it is watching each other. Um, I'll send out a link to watch a video of one of our BYOT tours in just a minute. Um, but it, it, it is, everybody's in a different place on the journey and there isn't one right way. And I think that it's the kind of thing you have to realize you're always learning more about BYOT because the devices keep changing, the apps keep changing, the tools keep changing, you, and, and the kids keep developing and learning more because as you see, babies know how to use iPads now and they're coming to school. I mean, it's a huge wave that we're seeing of, of more digital age learners in our schools, and we're trying to make sure that they're engaged and ready for a future that's going to be very globally competitive. And we're building on blocks that they already know, so they're able to, I mean, do these uh, projects and other tools faster than we could ever do it. I would love uh, a chance to hear from more people um, who are, who are um, with us today. Um, I'd love to hear more questions from the audience. And I, I see that there are a lot of questions happening in the, um, in the chat. And we'll see if we can try and respond to some of those maybe on audio in addition to in the chat thread. But if anybody's brave enough to want to raise their hand and um, ask a question, I, I would love that. Um, I know we don't have a lot of time for all the questions, but one of them was, how do you deal with rural students who may not have um, internet at home or the equipment to bring in to support the learning in the classroom? Um, I teach at a um, high school with, that has 150 students. It's a small rural school in central Illinois, and um, we haven't seen that as an issue. I think um, there are, certainly are pockets in the United States where um, uh, internet is not available. Um, I have a fiber line. I live in the country on a farm and I have a fiber optic line at my house. Um, and the, the students, um, you just have to really um, survey your own student body to see what it is. I think it's a too broad of a um, situation just to say it, it happens this way. All, all over, but we found that when we surveyed our students that many of them did have devices that um, that they were using already and or could bring in and that the school had enough um, devices available that we could um, cover the students that didn't. And how do you encourage teachers to um, invite this technology in their classroom and create the buy-in? Uh, I think that something um, teachers need to be willing to do is, and this is a really scary thing, but take a risk. That's the first thing you need to do is just hold your breath and jump and see what happens. And that's really scary for classroom teachers often. Um, but the next thing that you can do is try and meet other people who are doing these things, who are already experimenting, and let them model it for you. Um, if it's coming from the top, top down in your, in your school, if you are an administrator or if you have your administrator's ear, um, the more people modeling it from above, um, the, more, uh, the, the more comfortable everybody else in your school will be. So modeling is really important. So find a model or, or become a model. Without a doubt, buy-in is, is slow. We're, um, we're finding that, and I'll be quite honest with that, but we're seeing um, more and more things occurring that um, and not actually being shared. I uh, will 
question my students, I'll question the teachers privately, and they're saying, oh, yeah, we're training in assignments paperlessly. We're doing, um, we're doing projects that, you know, were not done before BYOT. And it's like, ah, this is great. We need to share it with each other. So I think teachers generally um, are private individuals and don't share things as much as they should be. We need to get out of those silos of our classroom being closed doors and open them up and tell everybody what we're doing. You know, I also I ask teach when I go into schools, I ask teachers to bring in activities that they've already done, and then I'll I'll throw out they'll show me the activity, and I'll throw out five or six tools that they say you could do this or do that or that, and it shows something they it has, gives them something they already have a value and a comfort level with, and then they and it gives them the opportunity to try something that they don't have to change they don't have to change what they're doing in their classroom. Yeah, it doesn't have to be transformative on day one. It, you, can, right. you can ease into it. And in fact, um, people adopt technology and adopt innovation at their own speed. And you can't force them to go faster than they're, than they're comfortable. Um, and adoption in any given um, group, in a specific school or a specific community, can take from beginning to end, from the most innovative in your community to the, to the most resistant in your community, that adoption can take four to five years, tends to take four to five years. And it's important to realize that. It's not going to happen overnight. Take your time, experiment, give things a try, see what works and what doesn't, and don't be afraid to fail. And reach out to anybody you can that you think you can learn from, both as a teacher and as a student. Right, I, I said that uh, it, it's just always a process because the devices change. So even though you became transformational, maybe you have to go back and learn how to use a new device, learn a new app, then you apply it to what you are already doing, and then you can start using it to do something transformational. And it's just a process that has to keep has to keep happening in the classroom as long as the it's the culture that is established in the classroom. And in fact. We're finding out that BYOT is actually more effective in our classrooms where the teacher has a really good community, and not so much where the teacher is really techy, but the, where the teacher is willing to learn alongside the kids. Kim left the room. I do have some other questions I captured from before. Um, one was. With BYOT, I am more concerned with the app gap as most have their their own devices, but not necessarily the app enabled on the devices. What about that issue? Well, I saw that question earlier, and actually I wanted to respond to it and never got around to it um, okay. in the chat. Um, that is a really good question. And something I did say earlier in the chat thread is um, it's okay if not everybody has the same device. Teachers and schools can be so afraid of inequity and one student has and another student doesn't. And this is a great opportunity to remind ourselves that something of another skill that we should be teaching in schools, which is which is how to share. And if one student has an app enabled device, it's okay for them to share it. And you might need to talk to your administrators or parents or the kids about um, about what that means when we're talking about hundred dollar plus devices. I mean hundred dollar, five hundred dollar, thousand dollar devices. But um, but it's still important to share these things, and it's it's not okay to hoard them, and it's not okay to have access to them and not use them. I think it's a waste. And um, there's so. Oh, sorry. I was going to go ahead for a minute and say that there's there's something to having one device at a table where it forces students to have that conversation that. That maybe not even two students would have, but four or six students would have, uh, say, "Oh, I would add this or I would add that." It's sort of that, also that smart board mentality where one student goes to the front and is doing something, and then another student might say, "Hey, no, I would do it this way or I would do it that way." So, not not, not everything has to be personalized to that individual student. And. I think a not, of, a not a lot of credit goes to the devices that are not app enabled. Um, and this actually I think gets even scarier for teachers sometimes. But um, cell phones are actually amazing devices for communication. And for some reason we forget that in the classroom. 
um, text messaging, phone calls. Um, I don't know if the service is still available, but at one point you could Google for answers via text message, although they may have discontinued that service. Um, but, um, but you can text a parent from the classroom or a grandparent from the classroom or text another classroom. And if you don't have devices that are an app enabled in your, in your room, um, you can text to another classroom that does and collaborate that way. Um, you can also, uh, I lost my train of thought. But, um, but remember that just because it's not app enabled doesn't mean it, it's not valuable. Thank you. There was a question about BYOT being too easy for kids to just IM friends instead of doing work. This person knows uh, disengaged teens that will text the whole time instead of learning. I mentioned about texting, but in a more productive way. But the question has to do with texting, just to text, I think. Well, and I think that a lot of that goes to, and, and, and it can happen with younger kids who might want to pull out their favorite app to play a game or whatever, mm -hmm. but I, I think that the, it goes to the expectations of the teacher in the classroom and also coming up with instructional activities that are, are so engaging that that's what they want to text about or that's what they want to be involved in. And that can only happen when the instruction is personalized to the kids and they get to make choices. I think Jeremy talked a lot about that, about the kids really being invested in what they are learning about. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't say that there's some really easy answer to that because, of course, that can happen. But again, it's about the community and the culture in the classroom. I'd like to share something that Michelle Little and I like to say, a little mantra that she and I kind of have, which is, um, and Michelle Little is the teacher in, in uh, New Canaan Public Schools in Connecticut. Uh, she's a librarian down there. She and I have a saying, let the learning distract from the tools. Don't let the tools distract from the learning. It's a classroom management issue, not a technology issue. And that can come off sounding really harsh um, to a teacher who says, well, wait a second, but my kids are Facebooking and texting and, and doing all these different things. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm beside myself. I don't, I don't know what to do. Um, don't blame me. Don't blame the teacher. I, I don't mean to be blaming teachers at all. But if you just step back and take a deep breath and realize that um, it's okay for them to explore, but also realize that, you know, maybe there's some things that you don't want them to explore right now. It becomes a classroom management piece, just like passing notes, just like whispering to each other, talking out of turn, shouting when they, uh, you know, using your indoor voice. It's, it's classroom management. It's not technology. All right. Brian. I am so true, Tim. Thank you. Did you have any additional questions? I did have a couple, Kim. Um, how do students connect? Does that, does that vary? I had caught a couple questions about connecting with their own data plan or with the school's connection. Generally, it's school Wi-Fi, and um, we discourage the use of um, their own individual data plan for mm -hmm. filtering. Mm -hmm. But there's there's no way that a, a school district can absolutely stop that from occurring. Sure. Okay. And let's see, do I have any others? Actually, I'd also like to jump in there and say it, it, is, it, it depends on the school because there are schools where um, the kids might have 3G and 4G devices, in which case it's great to take advantage of those. Um, and, you know, you have to be aware of their data plans and, and you don't want to cause overages for these kids and these families. But, um, but it's good to realize when you have those, um, th that, that ability to, to uh, take advantage of 3G and 4G plans. Um, some schools that we work with, we've encouraged them, encouraged them to get um, Verizon or at t or other company um, uh, portable hotspots to take the, the learning out of the classroom. And in that, that case, it might be, um, it might be school provided, uh, Will provide a 3G or 4G connection, but you can also ask the parents if they have something they'd be willing to lend to the classroom, if anybody would like to donate something to the classroom. Um, but I think it's important to, to, to try it, see, see what's available. Don't, you don't have to rely on the Wi-Fi connection, but there are also Wi-Fi connections out of the school if you take the kids out of the school. There are some municipal Wi-Fi connections, you know, there's cafes. Um, 
it, it, you don't necessarily have to rely on the school. Definitely, and the students don't have a problem. And we want to go ahead and let you know and encourage you to join future ta uh, chats with the team if you have questions um, that come up. We won't have another session until um, the, the new year, but we want to let you know that Steve Hargadon will be interviewing David Richard on January the 8th. And we'll be off for two weeks, but then we'll be having a very special um, episode in January, our end of the year review. And then on the 12th, we'll have Joe Dale, more about using iPads and mobile devices. On the 19th, we're not uh, sure. And then on the 26th, there's going to be lots of things going on that day. Um, I think uh, SciCon from the DIN and EDUCON. And then back on February the 2nd. So um, we won't have a show, but our next show will be um, until January the on January the 5th. So we want to let you know about that. And if you'd like to nominate an educator or any educator or teacher that works with students, please do so in the survey that will automatically open as soon as you exit the session today. Or you can go to the uh, survey link that's shown there. All of these links are also in the live binder. So if you need this information at any time, you can use the live binder to contact us. And if you participate in any session or watch a recording, especially over the next two weeks when we don't have a show, if you watch a recording, um, please access that survey link and then Peggy will send you a survey. Just put your name and, and um, what video you watched or recording that you watched. And you can also nominate a future teacher and put that in your comments on the survey today as well. Or use that future teacher um, survey link that's in the live binder. We want to let you know that we also have an iTunes U channel so that you can subscribe to the MP3 and MP4 of each of our sessions. And if you click on that link that's in the live binder, it takes you directly to the iTunes U channel and then you can subscribe easily. And Peggy just posted that in the chat. You can also subscribe through an RSS feed reader and that's located on our archives and resources page. We put a blog post of all of the resources shared and the recording links as well. So you have an option of either way that you would like to take us with you wherever you go. And we want to extend a very special thanks to Steve and Jeremy and Tim and Nathan and to each of you who participated in the chat today and to Steve Hargadon, who is our founder of this webinar series and to Weebly for providing our website so that we can post this information and share with you each and every week. And as we break for, this is our last show of the year, we want to um, just keep in our minds, thoughts, and prayers those who were affected in the school shooting recently up in Connecticut. Um, it'll be a difficult Christmas for them. And we want to... <coughs> Wish our very um, wish you the happiest holidays and the best New Year's celebration. I hope that everybody stays safe, warm, and has a <coughs> has an incredible holiday. Whether you celebrate Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, whatever um, you're going to be doing, we hope that you. I agree. School shooting shouldn't exist. Um, we hope that you um, have a wonderful family time. Um, with your family online or your family face-to-face. Uh, -face. So thank you so much for joining us. Be sure to check back our website and keep in touch. And join us on January 5th for a very special end-of-the-year celebration, SmackDown, whatever we have planned. Um, you're going to definitely enjoy it. So have a great weekend. Um, enjoy the rest of your holiday plans and festivities. And we will see you in the new year, 2013. Take care, everybody. Have a great day.